teacher and say, folks, there's lots of room up here in the front. And while we did this uh, as a full dog and pony show on Monday morning um, with just the diehards here, I think it'll work a lot better if we come on, uh, let's really roll with it and take the, um, take, uh, take a microphone down here, sit with everybody. Come on up and let's turn it into a discussion, please. <clears throat> Well, a uh, little different uh, setup than we have had in a number of the other gigs, but maybe this will be a little bit, um, a little bit more like an easygoing conversation, except uh, it's already starting badly. I see a terrapin in the very front row here against this UVA guy, and uh, I'm sure there will be some kind of fighting words if we put some couple of once proud football <coughs> teams that have had a poor couple of years lately. So. I lost uh, dinner to a colleague of mine when Maryland beat Virginia in Virginia last year, so dang the luck. Okay, um, I'm Dave Belote. Some of you may have heard uh, stories of the Siding Clearing House and this new way that we have to uh, take a look at all utility scale um, energy generation and transmission to make sure that it's compatible with nearby, um, uh, nearby missions, and I'm joined today by uh, Supervisor John McQuiston of Kern County, California, and Commissioner Joe Briggs of Cascade County, uh, Montana. I'm going to spend a little time. I will go through the slides. Otherwise, you know, my Booz Allen guy who actually put them together for me would. <laughs> I'm going to flip through the slides quickly um, so that folks can understand. But this, this is a small enough crowd. We ought to be able to do this as a nice little conversation. Um, I'm going to set up how we kind of got in the bind that we found ourselves in, uh, you know, in conflict with local entities and industry over exactly where to put wind turbines and solar towers, how we ended up uh, creating a, a way to fix it, and um, Commissioner Briggs and Supervisor McQuiston are going to tell how their counties kind of got way out ahead of, you know, DOD for sure in this case, to make sure that they created an environment of compatible use and cooperation early. Um, and their stories will, I think, resonate with a lot of folks. Um, let me ask, since there's so few of us, uh, I see one uniform, so I'm guessing we've got um, a, maybe a civil engineer or a planner or Captain, what brings you... Uh, Ah, okay, so um, you're in the public partnerships office. I, I know a guy who made sure that the Air Force um, manned that office, but it, it, uh, it, it took a couple of years of fighting City Hall for Air, the Air Force to think that, wow, you know, right here, the 99th Air Base Wing Commander in Las Vegas at Nellis Air Force Base has 42% um, of the United States Air Force's land. So the Air Base Wing Commander is the mayor of three small towns, this uh, county manager of an area larger than Maryland. And what we had to do there was 
create an office that essentially scoured four county and six city uh, planning commission and um, council agenda websites just to figure out if something might be going on that we needed to be talking about. So different part of the story. How about uh, uh, Commander, where you, or is that, uh, is that an eagle? Commander, um, the, the, the fighter pilot eyes aren't what they used to be, and I was having a hard time making out what was on the collar. And I see a, a nav fact from, is that Norfolk or Suffolk? Um, so we've got naval facilities. Uh, uh, my good friend from the University of Maryland, um, uh, where are you in from? And Okay, and so a little bit of stuff on uh, wind turbines and how they impact you, how, how they might impact Pax River. Something that we wanna get our minds around because we know it's coming as well. Um, how about y'all, where are you in from? Ah. Caitlin, you explain her from, uh, from Georgia. Okay. Welcome. So her office uh, feeds the clearinghouse um, directly with uh, work on Navy installations. Sir, how about you? Okay. NAFAC Southwest where? Okay. Sir. Dan Kogart, NAFAC Marianas. Wow. There, there's a good, uh, a good quote about, um, yeah, that comes from former Representative Jane Harmon about everything that happens inside the Beltway. Uh, it, this was having to do with the law to replace incandescent bulbs with um, you know, cool fluorescence. Uh, and you know, the old bulbs that are being replaced, like much of Washington, were 90% you know, heat and only 10% light. So <laughs> that's... Uh, that's what happens inside the Beltway for those of us who live there. Sir. Welcome. Yeah, a couple of turbines here and there around Dias. Okay, well, um, lots of folks who come to this know this slide already, but uh, when I go out into, uh, when I say the folks who have come to a sustaining military readiness conference have a pretty good idea, but um, I'll get asked a lot of times, hey, how far away from a base uh, can a wind turbine be or when do you care? And the answer is it depends because we have such a wide range of missions and such a wide range of potential impacts from various kinds of technologies. Um, and as you'll see as we flip through these slides, uh, we're out there defending the homeland. We've got a network of long-range surveillance radars that um, you know, surveil the coasts, the borders, uh, interior for some critical vulnerability or critical infrastructure assets. Um, so that's one big thing. But then as we have talked throughout sustaining ranges, uh, we have huge training areas, huge areas that we test in, um, and there are different requirements for all of them. The folks from state and local government uh, recognize what we belatedly found out. There's just an absolute mishmash of uh, coordinating authorities, permitting authorities, planning authorities, um, and nobody wearing uniforms ever really knew where to look or unless there were some unique relationships in the local communities, long-standing relationships, lots of times with the uh, civilians in a civil engineering squadron or something of the sort with uh, their counterparts in city government. Absent those, um, folks on the base never really heard about the 800-foot uh, solar tower that might be going up 10 miles down the road or you know the 43 wind turbines that were planned for about 10 miles um, off the runway. And so 
we surprised each other an awful lot. There was no place to, uh, for the military to be officially notified unless something was going to be 200 feet or taller and it was going to go through the FAA's process. And that FAA filing process only has to occur 30 days prior, or used to have to occur 30 days. It's been moved out all the way out to 45 prior to construction. So those of you who uh, have some planning background know that 45 days prior to construction, there's already been tens of millions of dollars of site prep and research and probably years of analysis and permitting and discussions. And we found ourselves in a couple of situations where you know somebody put their hand up and said, uh, please don't build that there. And after millions and billions, folks got frustrated. Wait, why in the world can you be saying that? Um, the good captain and I were just uh, talking about this wonderful spot, and this was a success story. It took us a little pain and some time to get there, but because industry wanted to deal with the issue up front, they came to us, and I was the uh, um, I was the base commander out here. I was that guy who was county manager for this whole chunk of southern Nevada, which is uh, the 2.9 million acre Nevada Test and Training Range. And the CEO of Solar Reserve Corporation asked for an office call. And I wasn't sure why. I thought it was kind of cool and interesting. Um, Nellis is the second largest employer in the state. And I had contracts and you know lots of engagement. So I thought maybe this is just one of those engagement kind of deals. And he comes and he puts his finger on the map about right there, four miles from the northwest corner of uh, the NTTR. And he says, that is the spot for the concentrating solar molten salt collector that is going to change solar energy generation and storage as we know it, revolutionize the industry. 110 megawatt plant um, with this cool molten salt uh, technology that we've developed. We store the sun's power in the form of uh, you know, about 1,200 degree liquid salt. And we meter water through it. And depending on the needs of the utility versus exactly when the sun's shining, we can put power deep into the hours of darkness. Um, you know, this salt goes up into the top, gets heated to almost 1,200 degrees, stored in a semi-buried tank down at the base, and you use it to drive turbines. And I'm thinking, hey, that's pretty cool. However, there's some stuff going on in the center of the range that we don't talk about very often. And I don't think the uh, guys in dark suits and black Ray-Bans um, would be very happy with me if I said go ahead and build that there. Now that was their going away or their entering throwaway argument. He knew that. So he comes about right there. It's now 20 miles from the range. He says, how about doing it here? And I said, I'm still a knucklehead F-16 pilot. 20 is better than five, but let us take a look at it. Now, the other reason that we have an office like ours now to, to take a look at all this, I commanded 42% of the Air Force's land. I had no tools, techniques, teams, or ideas how to assess the mission compatibility of a solar tower against the stuff that goes on inside the range. And I went knocking on doors inside the Pentagon and the air staff and OSD, and people told me, hey, Colonel, that sounds pretty cool, but uh, not our problem. Interesting, if you figure something out, let us know. Hey, well, this is great. We had a couple of guys with green eye shades do their best to find some radar propagation models. And you know, I finally can tell people one example. You know, there are a few places in the country where we need electromagnetically pristine environments. You know, lots of places, and we'll talk later, we can cooperate. There are probable technological fixes within the next two to five years that will make most of the wind turbine radar interference problems go away. But there are a few places that we need to protect, and now, you know, since May, I've been telling people in this presentation, um, if you believe that the United States needs a few places where it can test and develop tactics for the kind of things that may or may not have been used in a raid in Pakistan back in May, um, then you need to help us carve out some of these spaces and just keep things away. And with that in mind, the Green Eye Shades guys came back to me after only four weeks and said that 20-mile site won't work for us because it raises electromagnetic interference in a couple of frequency bands that we care about. And I mean, this is kind of wacky science. A tower 20 miles from the edge of the range, which means it's more than 20 miles from whatever gizmos uh, we've got in there. But from all those miles away with intervening terrain, you name it, 
you know, there are things that are so sensitive that it, it sensed or would sense the spike. So I called the CEO back and he says, man, uh, you can't possibly have something in there that would see a single tower from 20 miles off the range. And I said, yes, I would. And it got a little contentious for a few months. It was always respectful. I had the unique experience of having a principal from the Podesta Group in Washington, D.C. call me up in my office and scream at me and tell me I was going to be known as the troglodyte that blocked, um, you know, the sea change in, in solar energy. I said, gosh, I'd rather be the troglodyte that facilitated it in precisely the right place, and that ain't it. Um, and a gentleman named Harry Reid decided he got tired of the back and forth, and he wrote a letter to Secretary Mike Donnelly of the Air Force. Um, and to paraphrase, says, who's this knucklehead below, and why is he slowing down this really cool project that I want for Nevada? <laughs> and if you're an 06 base commander, and the Senate Majority Leader writes your service secretary a letter with your name in it, the doors didn't close anymore. There was more attention than I could have ever possibly dreamt of. And, uh, but it, it really was the good kind of attention because with the Secretary's involvement, the Air Force Scientific uh, Advisory Board engaged MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, some folks with the kind of clearances and read-ins that they could actually do this work, um, and they did an incredibly nuanced analysis, and they came back and they said, believe it or not, the back of the napkin stuff on uh, the 20-mile site is correct. Valid entering arguments, there is an unacceptable spike in electromagnetic interference, uh, or would be since the thing hadn't been built yet. said, however, this site, Crescent Dunes, 35 miles away, if they stay in the northern two-thirds of the right-of-way application, there's enough absorption, terrain shielding, uh, et cetera, that we could live with it. They spill into the southern third, we would oppose. The company said, we can stay in the northern two-thirds. And 16 months after it all started, um, we had a success story. But it required a big shove from, uh, required a big shove from the senator, and it, was kind of frustrating for lots of folks. So I skipped on out of there. Um, I retired uh, in March of 2010, nine o'clock on a Friday morning. I gave up the flag of the wing. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon in the Oak Club Ballroom, I retired, wandered down the hall to the Nellis Bar, which pretty well-known fighter bar in the United States Air Force. And I don't remember much of the next 24 hours, but I'm told that I had a good time. So I skip on out and to use a really bad pun, the shepherd's flat scenario blows up. And here what happens is that FAA process rolls in and 30 days before turbines are going to go in uh, to a incredibly high wind resource area in Oregon, um, it's not an Air Force colonel this time who raises his hand in public and says, please don't build that there. It's an Air Force four star, the commander of US Northern Command says, if those um, turbines go in, they're going to block my ability to use uh, one of my long-range radars that I use to surveil the um, northwestern corner of the country, and I think you need to stop it. Well, General Electric Company in uh, Caithness, um, looking at this $2 billion project, um, were a little bit upset with that, and then the senators uh, from Oregon, Senators Wyden and Merkley, uh, applied some pressure, and I am told, I, I can verify all of that with emails and things that I've seen, I'm told that there were phone calls from the vice president to the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs and all kinds of stuff, and it turns out that the science, you know, good, hard-working staffers had given um, the four-star, the science wasn't really that good. And we learned that once we go outside the Pentagon with a story about if there is going to be some kind of an impact, it's going to very quickly get in the hands of incredibly well-paid consultants on the other side. And um, although the slides were glossy and the, uh, you know, the four-star was a very persuasive speaker, once they took a look at the science behind the slides, we got crucified because it wasn't quite as bad as we had thought and there were some fixes that would probably take care of it that might not cost that much. So MIT's Lincoln Laboratory gets involved and um, 
they say, yeah, here are some potential fixes, one called an adaptive clutter map where you just edit out the returns from the processor and it will keep the radar from being desensitized and we can also just do some tweaks, optimization to this, uh, you know, changing the tilt, changing gain settings, a few other things. So we stood down, turbines went forward, but Congress stayed pretty dang frustrated that it has, you know, to get these projects done, it took hard, hard pushes, and DOD had not created together a process to take a look at all of these, apply the science, apply the same standards across the country, um, and have a big uh, and open conversation with industry about what went where. So, with all that frustration, uh, my boss, coaxed me to coming back into the Pentagon. If you'd have held a gun to my head the day I put my uh, papers in and said, your first job upon uh, leaving active duty is gonna be back inside the Five Side Funny Farm, I would have said, please pull the trigger. It will not happen. But uh, Dr. Dorothy Robine, Deputy <coughs> Undersecretary of Defense for Installations, um, she and I had met. She'd seen what I was doing in Nevada. Um, and uh, she's a persuasive, very gracious, persistent woman. And the third time she asked, I caved and I took the job. Um, and one year ago this week, it was actually Tuesday, it was my one year anniversary, started trying to meet folks in all the services, meet folks out in the field, figure out how to scope this problem and you know, determine how we would come up with a uh, common solution and way forward. But halfway into that, Congress decided they weren't going to wait around, and they were going to tell us what to do to make sure that um, make sure that never again did things get as out of control and take as long as they had on those first couple. So, December the 9th, I'm feeling good about myself because I've done outreach to industry. I've got some folks at the American Wind Energy Association, a couple of the major players, ready to go with me to the Senate and House Armed Services Committees with um, how we preferred them to write the language, you know, be a little bit broader, a little bit easier. And we all agreed that if we go together to uh, what was then the lame duck session of, um, of uh, the last Congress, we would probably have a pretty good chance of getting um, the staffers to do what we wanted to do together. We never got that chance because six days after that meeting where I was feeling so good about things, uh, out of the lame duck session came the pre-conference to National Defense Authorization Act, passed uh, the House on the 15th or the 16th, it passed um, the Senate on the 22nd, and on January the 7th, the President signed the bill into law. And it had some pretty high bars and it, you know, held, it now holds DOD's feet to the fire in a big way. Um, you know, just to summarize so we can get to the funner stories of cooperation, uh, there are only two people in the entire United States Department of Defense who, by law, can tell the FAA we would like to object to a renewable energy project and officially request the determination of hazard. That would be the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of Defense, period. No Colonel. No base commander, no two-star, no four-star, no service secretary any longer has the authority to say, we object to that project. Wow. That was one of the things that we tried to not get them to put in the law and that industry had agreed with me. Man, that would be really tough to have that non-delegation clause. We'll, we'll try to make it a little easier on you. The non-delegation clause stuck. So if we are going to object to something, we've got to get it all the way up to the number two guy in the entire department, and you better believe we'll have all our science in a row, but there's a whole lot of incentives along the way to find ways to cooperate. I mean, the bar that we have to have to object to a project, you know, what I kind of did on my own as a colonel, hey, I don't think you should build that there, stop. We have to get the Deputy Secretary of Defense to say, that constitutes an unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States. And within 30 days of him saying that, um, we have to send a report to Congress that outlines what that unacceptable risk is, which mitigations we considered, and why those, why those uh, um, cost-effective and affordable mitigations won't work in this particular case. 
So golly day, that means we have to do a lot of research about how to mitigate, how maybe just recite a few turbines, um, you know, maybe find some kind of technological fix to the radar, do some kind of optimization. But we're going to have to prove to Congress that we considered them all, so maybe let's just talk way early about, hey, how can we work together when this is still on your drawing board? Um, because the burden of proof is going to be pretty high on us, so if we never ever have to go to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, because I can plead my case to you in such a way based on science and a uniform approach from across the services and across the country, you say, all right, I, I won't put that there, but this technology might work here, boom, we're golden. So that's really what we're going forward on. And Congress said, oh, by the way, you have to be able to do a preliminary review of anything filed with the, uh, filed with the FAA in 30 days, not the six or eight months that it was taking you on the things that you didn't quite understand. So what did we do? We got all of the, the stakeholders in the room, the services, the joint staff, uh, the OSD functionals of readiness installations, test, um, and homeland defense for the uh, homeland surveillance radars. And we've created a let's everybody talk and share information. Um, and we're building it around a computer system called MCAT. Some folks have seen the MCAT demonstrations, the Mission Compatibility Analysis Tool so that somebody sitting in California, you know, if the services said, we think you need to be a part of this and we want you to have the MCAT access and talk to the clearinghouse bubbas, somebody sitting in California or in Utah can look at the same um, computer screen that I'm looking at and that we're discussing back in DC, plot things out against various GIS layers that show us military training routes, special use airspace, uh, the radar bug splats that actually show the true line of sight at various heights from the radars that we care about. And we'll all talk about it. And we'll all discuss, is there a way to, uh, to get to yes on this one? Um, and we are going to analyze them through three separate lenses. We developed a kind of three by three matrix where we've got folks from the services, nominated by the services, um, that look at it from the impact on radars, long range radar and homeland surveillance. We've got a subgroup that looks at it from an impact on military training and readiness capabilities. And we've got a group that looks at it um, from uh, uh, test and evaluation. And that's the one that can be the stickiest because those are the places where we have to say, all right, let's, let's carve out a spot to protect because we can't let the line get past a certain point. Um, and we are very deeply engaged on a number of fronts at trying to determine scientifically where that line might be. We've got folks at NAVAIR and uh, Air Force Flight Test Center trying to determine um, the uh, line in Kern County that, and uh, San Bernardino and Inyo County around the R2508 complex so that folks know that, hey, you can build turbines up to this spot, but north or inside this particular line, you're going to have a demonstrable effect on our ability to test airborne radars. Same thing is going on with uh, Air Combat Command um, and a big test around the Nevada Test and Training Range to draw what they are, the scientists are calling isoclines, lines of equal electromagnetic interference, so that we can go out in the world <coughs> without ever saying, here's why. We're going to say, here's the science that we use. There is electromagnetic interference at this point. Um, and lay it out for everybody, provide the certainty that our partners in government and that industry need. And we'll check in those lines, you know, having determined that scientifically, that's ongoing, by the way, we don't have this done, um, but we will say, hey, nah, probably not an impact, that's gonna be green. Yellow, um, hey, there's gonna be an impact, but we can probably find a way to mitigate it. Red is the, oh my gosh, um, there's some cool toy that is going to be impacted. And in our 30-day review, we just have to reach a bar of significant impact. So we will tell the world that's green or that's amber. And you know the way we're setting it up is so that I can have our clearinghouse experts take a quick look, send it out to the services and say, you know, we're gonna do as much of the work as we can to take the workload off people out in the, uh, uh, out in the field or I only deal with the folks up at the Pentagon level in terms of 
putting these things out. But I'll say, all right, we've got 30 days. We think this is green. We think this is amber. Um, tell me you agree or you disagree. So uh, you know, we're going to try to give everybody the dots on a map and um, off they go. The services will come back and say, okay, we're good with that. It's green. If we get four by green across the board, then we're going to, you know, all the right people, the FAA liaisons will put the check in the block with the FAA. Um, if anybody says we need to look at it a little bit more, that'll go back in as an amber. The law doesn't say how long we have to take if we are doing this negotiation, but my dealings with the FAA, somewhere in the 90 to 120 day point, they're analysts start to get really nervous and start to turn up pressure on us to put some kind of an answer in the system. So we'll probably have about a three or four month chance for um, folks at, uh, you know, the, pretty much whoever the right person is down base level or maybe a regional command. Um, it'll be a case by case basis as to who goes out and actually does the negotiation. I'm dealing very frequently with folks in at the top level of the industry, directors of permitting for you know various uh, things like Iberdrola and AES, et cetera. But we'll have this big discussion, and we'll either get it from yellow into green because everybody agrees on a given layout or technology or you know setup, or if we can't get. Uh, to an agreement, then we start our internal process to get it up to the deputy secretary. That's right, because the again the law only says preliminary review, significant impact or not significant impact. And it was, uh, we're, we're still creating it. It was difficult to read in the services responses exactly where the line for them between yellow and red was. And since, oh, I'm sorry. She said when she saw the backlog list come out, instead of saying yellow or red, it said yellow slash red. I said, you're right. Because to, uh, to put it out there, the law didn't say, and uh, well, I realized as we were putting this all together, there are only two people who can say that is genuinely red. And so because we hadn't ever pressed the test and tried to get one all the way up the channel to say this is truly a red, the services believe it, you know, the clearinghouse board of directors, which is a slew of assistant secretaries, um, you know, so pretty high up, you know, they're the kind of sanity check red team that's right in there. We hadn't pressed any of these to test. So it's just, this is either yellow or red and we gotta keep working on it. So that's the new term, amber. Um, by law, They've got to come to the clearinghouse if somebody thinks there's a potential objection. Again, the base cannot decide. The base can make a strong recommendation through its chain of command. But if it's going to the FAA, we're going to see it uh, because we have super user status inside the uh, um, uh, inside the OEAAA tool, and we're setting up some automatic notifications such that every wind tower, met tower, and solar tower, the second it gets filed, We'll know it. So hopefully somebody down at the base has got something going. And the, the, the unique thing to do here is to link, and this is incredibly difficult, having lived in both the Pentagon and having been an installation commander, it's to make sure that these guys get the support they need because the best relationships and the most success happens down with boots on the ground, with people who know each other. And you know, I would not be able to go home and look myself in the mirror if I were responsible for invalidating everything that I lived for 24 years in uniform and create a process that's a 5,000 mile screwdriver from the Pentagon. Now, the idea is to do it exactly the opposite. Everything that I possibly can to support um, and facilitate robust relationships down at the base level, but do what Congress told us, and that's ensure a consistent position across the board and the tools that will allow the, uh, um, will allow the kind of analysis that needs to get done. So how this should work 
and uh, a good time for a segue into um, federal rulemaking. It's a slide a little bit farther down. Because part of the law also says that um, we have to have one place for state, local, um, industry, and uh, state, local, and industry officials um, and the general public to come to do early voluntary consultation. Um, uh, that would be 358 paragraph C3. Um, because that's in there, uh, we've got, you know, they're coming to me already. And so what I really need to be able to do is get the information through the service chains quickly to the people boots on the ground. And the other thing that we've got to do is make sure that people boots on the ground aren't for all the right reasons technically breaking the federal law by going out and saying, well, here's our objection. Oops, sorry, you can't do that. So we've got to make sure that the discussions I'm having to facilitate things with uh, Iberdrola National Leadership in Portland are mirrored by what's going on down at the bottom level. And we're still dotting I's and crossing T's, but the fact that a federal rule will come out, the lawyers uh, walked into my office in April said, Dave, you've never heard of the Administrative Procedures Act, have you? I said, no. They said, we can tell. All of this bit about dealing with the public, You've got to go through a federal rulemaking. So before too long, we will have uh, um, Title 32 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 211, that will you know, have something that people can look at and see that it's got to be a simultaneous and coordinated process with uh, the boots on the ground, warriors, and us knuckleheads in the five-sided funny farm. Uh, well, we. We are in the process of standing up a uh, mitigation oversight team. And the services, Air Force has already gotten me their three names. Um, uh, I'm told my Navy compadres are, are getting close to who's going to be there. And it'll be our job to feed through the service chain of command that particular negotiation. Um, now, that is a tough thing because uh, right now, under the FAA statute, the FAA would not issue a determination of hazard. Um, and under the set of the law, it, it's going to be pretty hard for us to say a turbine and an MTR can ever get to the unacceptable risk to national security. I mean, it, so for that, we pretty much have to appeal to the, uh, to the good graces of the people who are out there. Sometimes we don't have a whole lot because right now the entering argument for a per turbine per year royalty payment to a landowner is about 7000 bucks and so you know i was a base commander in a fiercely independent property rights state and i had one developer in particular that when i stepped outside the gate he screamed taking and so for us to be able to go to a landowner might be able to put 100 turbines on his land that we overfly say, we would like you to forego a $700,000 a year payment because we fly there, that's going to be a tough sale. I, right. I, I, who passed the law? I mean, absolutely. I mean, and anybody who swore an oath, commissioned officer or civilian, um, we pretty much have to do the law. Now, I have already been back to BLM. You know, there were one case in point um, in clearing the uh, backlog, uh, there was a spot that goes into the UTTR and a, a request for about 300 turbines to go across an MTR. Now, I'm an F 16 guy. Is it that tough for me to pop 500 feet for a couple of miles and drop back down? Not really. Uh, potentially more of an impact on rotary wing in certain places or C-130s. But I had recommended to the services that they color that yellow and we go and try to negotiate a kind of layout that preserves part of the MTR. And that's 
going to be my going in argument every single time. And both the Navy and the Air Force overturned my recommendation and said, nope, uh, just color that one green. That's not one where we're going to fight. And so BLM asked me what to do. I said, please, through the regional environmental coordinators, ask if there is a way to you know, lay this out such that we preserve about half of the MTR and we can keep a four ship um, of fighters and tactical spread the whole way through. But at this point, because the services have already said we can live with that, that does not cons uh, constitute unacceptable risk. It's just asking you know, community partners to partner with us to, um, to preserve something. But uh, the other thing that we are trying to get that would allow us potentially to carve out an exception for very important MTRs and special use airspace is uh, I just this week put in a legislative proposal um, to amend the FAA's statute to add military training and uh, testing and operations to the things for which they can um, issue determination of hazard. Um, because right now, if we say you've got an impact on our long-range surveillance radar, if the FAA has an interest in that radar, it's technically termed an air navigation facility. So if we say getting our eyes poked out at that radar is an unacceptable risk, the FAA can say, all right, for that I can give you determination of hazard. Um, they couldn't do that for a turbine and an MTR. And so uh, we're going back to ask if we can get that protection specifically put in there, because I think if something is so important, we would take it all the way to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and he were to ask the FAA for a determination of hazard, that the FAA ought to be able to just do it, because that's a, you know, pretty high bar, they've said, if we reach that bar, but we're not at that point yet. We've got the legislative proposal in, and after the debt ceiling, I guess they'll uh, get to work on fixing 358 for us. Captain. You are absolutely allowed to talk with them, but realize, n no, realize now, or once it's published in a federal rule, realize that there is a process, a written process that has been foisted upon us. Um, so you've got to let us know. And it'll be up to your service. A, pretty much if it's a renewable energy project, a utility scale renewable energy project with mission compatibility things, all I need to do is know about it so that the service folks up at the top and I can talk about, you know, how does this fit into everything that's going on around the country. The danger of just talking without notifying is, uh, you know, somebody comes up with a solution or says there isn't a solution that actually two states over worked fine. So what we want to do is make sure when you're having those discussions, you've got the whole picture and that this is part of, um, an entire solution nationwide rather than the little onesies and twosies because the onesies and twosies are what got us in trouble and what got us beat over the noggin with uh, you know the high high bars in the law. You are absolutely allowed to say that just tell me it's going on. I mean, w and see, the other thing that I, the, the reason we've got to talk about it, um, there have been, uh, folks around Nellis are pretty used to this, and there is an office set up to do it, and, you know, some historical knowledge. Um, we have had some issues where others have rolled in and tried to joust in the county planning process or at a, you know, county commission rather than, you um, rather than sit down and solve this. And I was, I was dealing with the national leadership on the same issue as I get surprised by some stuff going on at the county level and we had a major disconnect. And I have had, uh, you know, there's some frustration with various parties with each other as this goes along. And what I can't allow to happen is a situation where 
they never go to you at the base level because they get tired of getting different answers depending on whom they talk to. And that's also Congress's point, is they, they don't want different answers at different levels. They want a consistent position. So the absolute worst would be a disconnected process whereby industry says we're never going to the base level again. We're rooting everything through the clearinghouse. Um, that to me is the worst of all possible answers. So what we've got to do is make sure that we're connected so industry doesn't decide there is one and only one way and we're going to the Pentagon and going top down because that's not as effective. Sir. Uh, I think uh, in our draft um, DOD instruction, we're thinking 750 kilowatts or above. That's because there are some single turbine installations that are about 750 kilowatts that we know um, have enough of an electromagnetic spike that, that we need to know about it. Yes. Okay, and, and, and where? Uh, how presented to this area? On the In the entire country. I mean. And, and that's the trick. We can have large spinning things and radars that disagree with each other from miles and miles and miles away. And the other reason that we got, uh, you know, hit by a lot of this is all of the services auto-screened anything more than like 12 miles from their base or outside of an MTR, they auto-screened it out. And so nobody in the service ever looked at it. Nobody in the community ever knew that this set of uh, 43 turbines 12 miles from some facility that they may or may not pay attention to could possibly have an impact. And then all of a sudden, boom, how can you possibly build that there? But I'm taking that one on by setting up the FAA system so that my guys uh, working on a Northrop Grumman contract, you know, working off of MCAT and a couple other tools that we are home growing, every single application for a turbine, solar tower, or MET tower, I really don't care about PV. I tell people, I, I tell people PV for all my friends. Flying over it is, you know, I, I had the great good fortune of operating what until just a couple of months ago was the largest photovoltaic array on the continent. Um, you know, Nellis has a 14.3 megawatt array that produces about 30% of the base's power. Flying over it's like flying over a lake. It's designed to absorb and transform energy, not to reflect it. Um, it doesn't have much of a, uh, a radar impact. Solar trough. The, we have enough science now to know that the glint glare is not as bad as we feared, and you, um, we know what the, uh, the focal length is, and the focal lengths uh, are so short that the place where you would get retina damage if you were a pilot and looked into one of these heliostats, you have to be within about 10 feet plus or minus of the distance from the heliostat to the, uh, to the solar collector. And there are almost no conditions in which you're going to be that precise distance. So the, the danger of uh, retinal damage to a pilot is pretty much non-existent. Yes, you'll get a whole face full of sunlight and you'll get a little flash blindness, but you do that when you're in basic fighter maneuvers anyway. You were trying to drag your opponent through the sun and you flipped open your, uh, your visor and you're trying to maintain um, you know, a visual and boom. So we know what's going on. So pretty much trough and uh, PV, when it comes to us, you know, we will probably go to the services and say, we see nothing, you know, and I will bet you they'll come back and say, we see nothing. So PV for all my friends. It really is, at this point, the most mission compatible um, you know, renewable energy source that I know of. Uh, I have a ton of respect for the men and women that I've met in the wind industry because they're out there really trying to do some good stuff. But 80 to 90 percent of what we deal with in the clearinghouse are large spinning things. And, you know, the ones that may be 80 miles from something, you know, no base civil engineer is ever going to look at a uh, project development 80 miles away and think this could be an issue. We have found out the hard way it can be which is why, you know, 
we're taking care of making sure we find out about all the wind and making sure that the services know. Um, and you know that that'll fix that problem because we can't ask base commanders to be aware of turbine installations 50 miles away, but we need to know about them. We're going to put it in, and we've got, you know, in the, uh, in the backlog review, I think there were about 30 solar installations. Um, but we're going to take a look at it, and, I mean, within days, you're going to hear back, we got it, we're tracking it, it's fine, go forth and do good things. But these people, or representatives of these people, are the ones who get the vote. Um, we've got... Uh, my boss, and we now, um, until two weeks ago, this was just what we were trying to create. Um, uh, two weeks ago, a gentleman named Panetta signed a designation memo that said, all right, um, the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Installations and Environment is the lead organization to execute all of these 358 responsibilities. So it now is delegated in writing, and this is what we are creating to execute what has just been delegated. I and E, my boss, Dr. Dorothy Robine, Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Readiness, um, Dr. Laura Juner, uh, Mr. Dave Duma, who's here, Principal Deputy Director of Operational Test and Evaluation. There are the three co-chairs, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, Jackie Fannin-Steele, um, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, Paul Stockton, Assistant Secretary of the Army, uh, Catherine Hammock, um, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Terry Yonkers, uh, Vice Director of the J-5, um, two-star Major General Sam Angelella, and then us feeding them. This is the voting board that if we ever get to the we can't, uh, we can't find a way to yes, they're the ones who will be our murder board and decide, yep, we're taking it to the DEPSEC or no, we're not. It, it's not going to get to that level. We'll just suck it up or whatever. And these are the people through whom I get the information out, so, um, and also uh, through the regional environmental coordinators, primarily in the West, CPLOs in some places are starting to plug in, or scenic representatives and a few others listening into our weekly calls. It will be up to the services who gets MCAT access and who calls in and talks about this with us. But again, the goal is for us to talk about everything. Hey. Uh, do you know of any potential impact here? Nope, I don't. Hey, yeah, that actually might be a problem. That is a brand new reflective PV. No, I'm making that up. Um, so it's my job to make sure that these people don't get surprised, and then it's their job through their own chains and processes to get it down, uh, you know, and also to find out what you guys are doing that influences our relationships on the Hill and with the senior folks in the industry. At this point, yes. We have had so much, uh, yeah. And the, the federal rule part deals with two things. It deals with what happens on the real FAA, and then it also deals with setting up a voluntary early consultation process. And industry has been all about, hey, we want to go here. Will you do a fatal flaw analysis? And we are, when the rule comes out, it'll be official. Um, I got like four of them yesterday. Industry is starting to send me uh, layouts and say, is there anything here? And we're taking a look, and if we see nothing, we say, nope. And we, we have to, I haven't pushed one through the lawyers yet, but we've got to come up with a caveat. You know, I had a caveat that I glossed over on the other slide. We are not permitting authorities. DOD has no authority of any kind other than the moral authority to say, you know, we're you know, trying to protect everybody, so help us out here. Um, we advise any entity, state, local, or other federal agency that actually has some kind of authority. So we advise the FAA. Um, you know, we will put the advice out, you know, to y'all. So developer wants to come early, 
I'm going to see it, and with a little caveat that says this is not a final DOD position, but that looks okay, or hey, you know you are very close to R2508, and you know we may have a major impact that we couldn't mitigate. So that starts, um, you know, again, it's already going on, and uh, I got to figure out how to keep you guys aware. The wrecks, um, again, especially in the Southwest, um, are plugged into it, and they're plugged into MCAT. So when bases have um, big relationships with the uh, wrecks and Rios, um, I know that works. Uh, the Navy hasn't figured out how it wants the CPLOs to play. Um, so, you know, I, we haven't dotted those I's and crossed those T's. But the, uh, the whole goal for us all is to have this happen months in advance um, and to identify the potential fatal flaws months in advance. And then you know, the, the right thing at that point might be, hey, continue to talk to the base and see what you guys can live with. But uh, again, I am convinced that in two to five years, most of this problem will go away because we will have not only a process that's guided primarily by informed military judgment, but we're going to have some science behind us. DHS is in the process, a uh, $22 million project, and my colleague uh, Bill Van Houten um, will tell about that you know, next hour or so, um, to design a model that'll tell us the question we can't answer, and that's cumulative impact. At this point, there are 975 turbines around uh, Travis Air Force Base, and Travis has found a pretty effective way of solving that with technology and just a couple of minor modifications to their flight pattern operations. But is the 976th the one that's going to, you know, make the radar roll over and die? We don't know. And DHS's tool to model cumulative impact, et cetera, uh, ought to help. So um, I won't steal Bill's thunder because he's got a cool brief about, you know, how science will solve big chunks of it. So not too, uh, we didn't get the, uh, we didn't get Carter's signature yet, did we? Uh, we're, we're lacking one signature of the Undersecretary of Defense to be able to send the rule, which is drafted and already been staffed and agreed on by all the services, um, to send the rule over to the Office of Management and Budget for official interagency review, and then it'll get published as an interim rule and there'll be public comment and all that fun stuff. But we're pretty close to having this on the street, which will, put in, don't look for details here, it will put in broad terms the fact that Congress has told us to have this ability, um, you know, for one phone number. Really, uh, once we've got it all linked in, the clearinghouse, think of it as misutility. 1-800-Clearinghouse, um, uh, we think we want to do this. Okay, let me connect you with the right people, you know, who have the biggest equity there. Um, and over the next year, I think we'll really nail down how that information flows in both directions. Now, uh, the other part of 358 was you have 180 days. July the 6th was the 180th day. You have 180 days to find every project that uh, has been delayed by DOD objections or concerns and deal with them. Is there an issue or is there not under this new standard? And anecdotally, in uh, January when we read it, um, we thought there were about 100, 105 projects like that. Turned out there were 249. AWEA had been beating me over the noggin in some joint presentations uh, with a stat that DOD had delayed, deferred, or outright denied more than 10 gigawatts of um, renewable energy generation capacity. And I kept saying, come on, prove it. Well, unfortunately, I proved it to myself. There were 249 projects in the backlog. Uh, we cleared 229 of them. Um, and like I, I recommended that about 180 go green, and the services trumped me and took a big chunk of my yellow recommendations and said, nope, there, we're not going to get to that uh, unacceptable risk standard. It's not an unacceptable risk of mission failure. Um, so just clear it. So we cleared 229 projects, more than 6,300 turbines in those 229 projects. Um, and, uh, well, Tom Vinson had a slide a couple of days ago that um, the current 
average is 1.78 um, megawatts per turbine. We used 1.5 megawatts per turbine as a very uh, conservative estimate. And guess what? Yes, there are more than 10 gigawatts of renewable energy generation that we have just cleared that we had held up. Some of this is a paperwork exercise. We discovered that it was almost impossible to reconcile different FAA databases, BLM databases, um, stuff that had been tracked at base level. And so some of these that we just cleared probably got built a year or so ago. Some of these were abandoned, but the paperwork trail is clear and we've put everything out to, um, you know, to make things work. And uh, we've got, you know, we're taking about the next two to three months to look at the 20. And out of this, uh, out of the 20, 16 of them are in the FAA system, four of them are BLM um, right away applications. And I will bet you that uh, four, maybe five, stay bright red because they are applications in a place that's just absolutely awful and crippling to a, a test or a training mission. Um, I think about seven or eight of them, after we collect some more information, will go straight to green because there's you know really not much you could do and it won't get to the unacceptable risk, but we, we want to dot a couple of I's, cross a couple of T's, make sure the services are all happy with, you know, all the analysis that surrounds it. And, you know, seven or eight of them will probably get to green after a period in yellow where we do some <coughs> mitigation negotiations. That's why we're constructing that mitigation oversight team um, at the Pentagon now. Shoot. DHS. Um, not by rule, DHS, uh, DHS played in the backlog conferences because at that point they didn't have um, a button, uh, an icon, to be perfectly honest, in the FAA's uh, system. Now DHS has its own um, button, and uh, there is a joint program office, uh, Long Range Radar Program Office at Langley Air Force Base that takes DHS uh, radar oversight team, links it to, um, uh, you know, the Air Combat Command. Air Force is the force provider for NORAD NORTHCOM, so it's, uh, you know, in an Air Force chain. They take a look at everything and discuss it jointly, but DHS, uh, well, DHS can actually object to some stuff that we can't because we have to verify that it is an unacceptable risk, and, you know, what we're getting is NORAD NORTHCOM to take a look, and usually the answer is coming back, you know, we have ways to mitigate. It increases risk. We lose some visibility if, you know, something happens here. DHS is not held to the same standards, so I know of at least one already where DHS has, you know, asked for determination of hazard and NORAD NORTHCOM has not um, because, you know, they know they can live with it and it, it won't reach. Um, Pretty much, transmission is huge because if we're not, you know, in, in southern Nevada, we've got, and southern California, the world's best geothermal, the world, or the continent's best geothermal, the continent's best solar potential, and the coolest test and training ranges ever. So there, we're competing for exactly the same chunk of ground and sky. Other places, in between a phenomenal uh, renewable resource and the market that it would best serve is a big test or training spot in between. So Sunzia, Centennial, the things that are designed to get wind from eastern um, New Mexico to Phoenix, uh, designed to get wind from Wyoming and Nebraska down um, uh, to Las Vegas and Los Angeles, the Southwest Intertie. Those are the only ones that, that we're engaged in. In most cases, one of the DOD regional environmental coordinators will be the cooperating agency. And um, we're linking it to uh, uh, we're linking it to our negotiations with BLM and Interior at the Washington level and making sure it's good. Um, but we're applying the same kind of standard and, you know, we are looking for, uh, there are some places where we can define um, alternative routes would be an unacceptable risk and a couple of spots that, you know, we know of that we would take to uh, the Deputy Secretary. Um, and thus far in the NEPA process, people have said, all right, you know, we will look at these alternatives that are farther north or farther west, so. 
but yes, we're doing transmission in this process, primarily the 230 and 500 stuff, you know, the really big stuff that is very tall. And, you know, because of some issues around Fort Huachuca and White Sands, we're looking for some science to determine exactly what the corona is on a 500 kV line. Um, so we can justify, you know, a little bit of buffer from uh, a few places where we've got cool toys. We haven't answered questions. Uh, I, that's the first I've hit with that. Our input is going through the NEPA process um, and in California through the CEQA process. Uh, I would say it ought to be a base command representative or a regional command representative that is putting on the fancy duds and going and presenting to um, a public commission. Sure as heck shouldn't be a knucklehead from the Pentagon who used to wear a uniform or it, it's possible that I'm just really good with, uh, you know, Photoshop, but my get off the stage slide, you know, you have to decide is it Photoshop or have I really gotten to hang out um, with some cool renewable energy issues with some people who are uh, committed to it. So, but no, uh, I, as a base commander, I'd put on the fancy duds and, and go testify at uh, county commissions and, um, that should probably be, once we know we've got a coordinated position on, on the route, that should probably be the person who goes, you know, whether it's uh, a noobs Neubauer from Luke or, uh, you know, somebody from Yuma, Fort Huachuca, it should be a uniformed military representative to, to give that position. Well, the way we do that is staff it through our clearinghouse process and we make sure that we've really scrutinized those comments. I, I will agree, I have seen some stuff and I was probably guilty of some stuff as a base commander that wasn't, um, you know, super tight because we just didn't, you know, we got a lot of hard working, undermanned, overworked patriots out there and um, if we don't have a chance to, to dot I's and cross T's, you know, sometimes the comments are a little bit disjointed. So, all right. Um, Steve challenged me. He gave this brief for me on uh, Monday morning because my flight was late and I breezed in right about this time, about five after nine. He said, boss, the brief is too long. He challenged me to do it faster than he had done it um, and I failed. But I think there was some, you know, some good dialogue. We're going to take about the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes and um, go away from, you know, the stuff that we didn't do right and how we got beaten over the head and shoulders with a pretty restrictive law to fix it and what we're trying to do to maintain those relationships at your level while answering the problem Congress told us to answer. Um, but uh, we have John in the queue next. Yeah, who do you want? All right. Who do you want? Uh, well, what's... All right, so somebody who dealt with this a lot earlier and who very effectively made, um, you know, made a relationship between his county, uh, between some major military organizations and built a foundation for success is Supervisor John McQuiston. Good morning and thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll begin just with a little bit of my background. I've been in the Board of Supervisors of Kern County. I'm in my 14th and a half year, another year and a half to go. And uh, prior to that, I spent a career in the Navy working in airspace and air traffic control. Uh, I worked as a defense contractor for a couple of years and then was a DOD civilian at China Lake. 
uh, four or five years before running for office. And if my, uh, my last job was pretty much representing the Department of the Navy or the commander at the weapons division uh, with the external world, be it local communities, forest service, park service, uh, anything outside of the fence kind of being a focal point for communication and coordination. What I'm going to try to do here in just a few minutes is, is kind of tell you uh, some of the things that have occurred in the last few years and how we've uh, attempted to deal with them. I, I'm uh, learning an awful lot at the conference today. It's going to be very interesting and fascinating to see how, as local governments, is this particular uh, set of requirements are being implemented. Uh, you know how we can uh, how we can be an ally with the Department of Defense, and it's probably going to still require some growing pains over time. Uh, just real quickly, where is Kern County? Kind of in the southern central part of the state. We're right at the uh, southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, and it's quite diverse. If you took some vertical lines and kind of broke it into thirds, the eastern third is primarily Mojave Desert. And there we have the Air Force Flight Test Center uh, at Edwards. We also have the uh, Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division headquarters at China Lake, as well as the Naval Air Weapons Station at China Lake. And uh, China Lake, it's interesting you were mentioning land masses. They control about one third of the Navy holdings worldwide, about a million acres between their North Range and, and South Range. The uh, middle third, of the county is uh, predominantly uh, the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, mountains and mountain valleys, lakes, uh, a lot of recreation going on. The western third would be in the central San Joaquin Valley and uh, portions of the, of the coastal range. The uh, some demographics, uh, a little over 800,000 people, that's from the uh, 2010 census, were ranked 11th in population in the state and uh, geographically about the third largest. We did see a 27% increase in our population over the previous 10 years. Most of that in the uh, metropolitan Bakersfield area, even though California City, which is directly north of uh, Edwards Air Force Base, uh, saw double digit rises, I'm gonna say in excess of 40%. I don't know the, I don't know the exact number on that. I had it written down someplace, but uh, not readily available with me right now. Some other interesting facts about Kern County. If, if uh, in the area of agriculture, uh, we for decades have ranked number three or number four nationally in uh, agriculture, uh, produce, fruit. Uh, in oil and natural ga gas, uh, a statistic that a lot of folks don't know if we were a state, we would be the third largest oil producing state in the lower 48 United States, and we produce more natural gas than the uh, state of Oklahoma, energy rich in that respect. But also in the area of renewable energies, uh, we're, we've been kind of the pointy end of the spear as this has developed over time. We're the highest wind energy producing county uh, in the United States. Uh, we produce over 20% of the renewable energy that the state of California produces and within that, that category of wind and uh, solar thermal and, and uh, solar PV, in the wind area, we produce 20% of the wind energy produced in the state of, uh, of, of California. And uh, we've done that. We've, uh, we learned a few years ago that I'll talk about in a few minutes that some of this developed uh, and there has been an impact on the military mission when we realized it, some of the steps that we put into place, and a lot of it evolved because at the time wind went in. It uh, simply wasn't known to be an impact. There wasn't Doppler radars. We've had wind for 30 years since the uh, uh, early 1980s. But as I mentioned, we are home to both Edwards and China Lake. Uh, we're extremely supportive and, uh, of those missions. They're vital to us. Uh, one little data point that I haven't put out earlier, but since 1998, the Kern County, our real discretionary, hard general fund dollars, we put more money into supporting our military activities and up until about three years ago than the entire state of California. We put well over a million and a half dollars of hard dollars into activities that support those military installations. 
And we're also uh, home to the Mojave Air and Spaceport, first commercial spaceport that was uh, certified and licensed by the FAA. This is our renewable energy goal. We implemented it in February of this year. And our goal is 10,000 megawatts of renewable energy by 2015. And that includes the entire county. We're doing an awful lot of solar PV in the central San Joaquin Valley now. We're doing working with schools, water districts, our own buildings of rooftop uh, parking structure types of, uh, of, of projects. And uh, we currently have 3,800, a little over 3,800 megawatts in production right now, cumulative of all of the, all of the uh, renewable energy. And we have 6,200 and some change in the queue right now. And we believe that the goal that we've set, that we'll see all of that up and running and in production by our target year. Every, uh, every uh, business in every county, I suppose, has a little logo. I'll throw ours up. Uh, we, we brag that we feed the nation, fuel the nation, power the nation, and uh, defend the nation. And we're very proud of each of those. We have worked very hard with uh, building relationships. We do it, obviously, the formal routes that we have to, but we focus more importantly on the informal with respect to our staff and the planning and the staff at our military installations. We routinely have calls once a month or every other month. This is a, a extremely important. It's what we call the early warning where we, over time, we work through things. We built relationships. We built trust. And I've heard that several times in the uh, meetings today that ultimately it is relationships and the trust that we form that helps bind uh, bind us together in those critical problems with our, our local staff meet frequently and we, we ask questions, have you heard about this, what about this, and what about that? And it's a good dialogue of information. We also, at the policy level, uh, myself and uh, one of my colleagues uh, who represents the area of Edwards, I represent the air, area of China Lake, we routinely try to meet with the local base commanders, the operational commanders, uh, the regional commanders, whether it's a Navy region southwest or Marine Corps installations uh, uh, west, and to, to stay in touch. And it, it particularly at the state level, uh, we form some really good friendships and partnerships because when I usually ask a base commander, who impacts your mission more, Washington, D.C. or Sacramento? And it's usually Sacramento through the statutory regulatory scheme. And oftentimes we have the, the opportunity as legislation is coming forward for us to engage and embrace and take positions in support of the military. <coughs> and it's proved to be very, very effectively. We also work with our local communities. There's an Edwards Alliance, a China Lake Alliance. Uh, as I mentioned, we work very closely with the uh, legislature uh, and uh, with the governor's office, primarily the governor's office of planning and research, which oversees the, the, the CEQA uh, process in California, and uh, also the military, the military mission. And uh, we also work with some regional partnerships, uh, as opposed to local partnerships. The Southwest Defense Alliance, we've been engaged in that since its formation in 1998 very active and we're now participating with the Western Regional Partnership and some of their working groups uh, in order to stay aware and to be engaged on the issues. Everything that I'm going to talk about today really, really kind of boils around these and I'm not going to go into them, but it, it, it really is a communication, coordination, uh, collaboration or working together and from that we, uh, we've come up with some solutions that uh, we think it, from time to time, driven by necessity, have been somewhat innovative in how we're going about trying to deal with sustainability issues as it pertains to our military installations. And I'm going to go through a couple of, uh, couple of things that we did. Uh, the, you, a lot of red, yellow, and green I found in, in, this, uh, in this conference this year. I'm going to take us back to the year 2002. This is where we had our wake-up call. We were very vocal, and we were very proud of our support of the military uh, and, and been very engaged. But in terms of 
of uh, the emergence of uh, encroachment, whether it's renewable energies, whether it's population growth and how that induces uh, growth in infrastructure, housing, commercial, industrial, uh, and the movement of that. Uh, we, we simply, you know, weren't at that point in time having to deal with that, and we learned that we had a major problem in the area of wind in 2002. Now, we've had wind in the Tehachapi wind area since 1980, and in 1986, we, we created a wind energy uh, area in Kern County, and uh, we've had hundreds of windmills since the, uh, the early 80s. What we learned, however, though, was that most of those windmills were the uh, first and second generation, most of them in the 65, 75, 85 foot length uh, or height. What we didn't realize when we created the, our wind energy uh, area was that we gave by right the, uh, the wind energy folks the ability as new, new <coughs> technology came around to take that existing structure and replace it with something bigger and uh, more efficient or they could take 10 of those smaller ones and eliminate those and put one or two big ones. But what we learned uh, by happenstance really was that uh, there, were, there were orders for generators that were gonna have uh, blade tips up to five or 600 feet. Uh, if you, uh, I'll show you a photo here in a minute, but where the Tehachapi wind area is underlies a military operating area with a 200 foot floor above the surface. So uh, now we had a situation where we're gonna have windmills penetrating the military operating area. So our, our board was very concerned about that. We, we deemed that a flight safety and a, a safety issue and using the powers that we have uh, within the state law, we enacted an urgency ordinance by a finding of undue adverse impact on, on public health and safety and we stripped the by right component of the wind energy to be able to unilaterally and without notification and discussion replace these. It was a huge, it was a huge hiccup. And uh, you, you can imagine uh, some of the discussions and dialogue that occurred. But uh, we did it and that urgency ordinance uh, was effective for up to a year. And I, I have to tell you that, that uh, I can't overstate uh, the participants from the military, and we used our local wind energy association, which was all of the wind companies that are doing uh, uh, alternative energy in Kern County, and they came together, and our board basically set the framework is, you need to find a solution to this problem. We're going to fix the problem, and the energy and the Department of Defense needs to come together and give us the tools in order to do that. It was a, a lengthy process, and it was, uh, it was a difficult process. We did not set in and facilitate the meetings. We stood at arm's length and said, bring us something that uh, we, can, we can deal with. And my, you know, as again, I cannot overpraise or over, overemphasize that these folks representing Edwards and China Lake and the wind industry did just that. And uh, after months of uh, hard work, this uh, map right here, and I don't know if we can shrink that one down or not because it's, uh, they finally gave me a final. Is that something we can go up on and uh, shrink down to about 50%? Uh, I don't know. There we go. This is what they came up with. <coughs> we took Kern County and uh, again use the red, yellow, green uh, colors and in very simplistic term, the green meant that if you wanted to locate uh, a wind energy project anywhere in this green, or green chart, you did not have to confer, meet and confer with the military. They have already agreed that there is no adverse impact. In the red areas, it was just the opposite. It is, this is going to have a substantial adverse impact on the military. And should you choose to use that, we local government do not have the legal ability to tell you that you cannot submit an application. But we're telling you by notice of this chart 
the likelihood that it's going to be approved is virtually nothing because we as a board in adopting this ordinance have already made a predetermination that we agree with the military and that this, uh, this is uh, uh, not the areas you should select. However, you're free if you want to come and put your money down and buy the land or buy an option on it. If you want to put your money down and spend two or three years in an environmental review. And oh, by the way, in California, unlike uh, other states under NEPA, the threshold is did you consider. It's more uh, procedural in nature. In California, CEQA goes beyond that. It's a substantive law. You have a duty to mitigate and uh, to meet that threshold. But if you want to do that and spend the dollars and try to convince us two years down the road and millions and millions of dollars later, it's your money. But it was a stern warning that, uh, you know, it ain't going to happen in all likelihood. And I've used the example several times. You probably would have a better chance of getting it permitted uh, or actually the reverse that, you'd have a better chance of winning the California lottery than getting, uh, getting this permitted because we think the, the test you have to meet is, uh, is uh, extremely, uh, <coughs> extremely hard to attain. And in the yellow areas, quite similar to what we've seen be below, the military basically said there's going to be an impact. But depending on the terrain, and depending on the height and depending on a lot of factors, we are willing to consider that on a project by project basis. And if it can be mitigated to, to less than significant, then the, the, uh, the military would not object. And we've had, uh, we've had several of those. This, uh, this was enacted in 2003. Uh, there's, to my knowledge, uh, Nobody has ever applied for a permit in the red area. Uh, a lot of new studies and uh, fact-finding is going on. I think what I've learned from uh, the meeting here this week is this chart is going to be you know, about uh, 10 years old in a year or two. And as we learn more, the facts and the science get better. I think that uh, you know we probably are going to have to revisit the lines on this on this map to, to more closely align with what we know now versus uh, what we knew then. But after we enacted that, the next thing that we, uh, we ran, a, ran across was, okay, if, if, if wind was our wake-up call, here you go, let me get you going again. What else is there out there that we don't know about? And we were beginning to get a lot of uh, inputs as California was growing, the, new cities growing up in other areas than, and these other sustainability issues. Sorry. There you go. Right there. So we wanted to think big. Uh, we, we knew uh, I had been involved in some of the other rounds of BRAC in my other life that the typical encroachment as it comes to urbanization is next to the fence, but we were learning more and more that uh, the potential of something that may happen 40 or 50 miles from the fence uh, that uh, may underlie a military training route or a military operating area. So working with our local base commanders at uh, Edwards and China Lake, they sponsored us for a joint land use study. Kern County put up the local match and the Department of uh, Economic Adjustment funded the R2508 Joint Land Use Study. This was our effort to look at potential things that might impair the military well beyond the fence, and we used the boundaries of the R2508 complex in order to do that. Uh, there's about five counties, uh, a dozen or so incorporated cities, uh, double that unincorporated communities. So we, we set about to do that. Now, Kern County's interest in this was pretty, you know, here's the Kern County portion of the R2508 complex, which you can see is not, not uh, a substantial part. But most of the lands underlying the R2508 complex are federal, are Los Angeles uh, water and power. And if you look, the white, the white is the private lands. And the, the types of population expansion growth that may come into play underlying the MOAs and the MTRs, we felt like in Kern County, if we could get ahead of the power curve here and looking at other potential conflicts, uh, that we could do an awful lot about 
the long-term sustainability uh, issues that might be population induced as growth moves closer and closer out of the urban centers and more and more toward the remote test and training areas. Uh, and that is happening. So this was kind of the parameters. I'm not going to go into the, all of the detail on that. I will tell you we set up a policy committee, an advisory committee, and if you look through that, you can see virtually all of the uh, resource agencies of the federal government, state of California, incorporated cities, counties, uh, Native Americans. We had the building industry there. Everybody was at the table and uh, putting this framework together. And out of that, uh, we, uh, we produced the, uh, the joint land use uh, plan, and I just picked one out of here. There were 61 strategies. These, these were not, these were things we needed to focus on and strategies to go about it, not solutions in the sense as a tool work and a framework of how we'd go about dealing with these in the issue, in the future. And this one just happens to be airport land use uh, plans for military facilities, but the focus was what's the strategy, what's it deal with, who's going to complete it, and when is that going to be done. We're, uh, we're currently at the, uh, at the stage of uh, uh, doing an implementation uh, component of that, working through OEA, our military commanders. We're going to pick four or five of the top priorities, things like real estate disclosures, uh, <coughs> if there's a necessity, working with the Edwards and China Lake and the DOD to perhaps look at other renewable energies besides wind, uh, solar PV or solar thermal, if we need some sort of structure there. The, uh, I, I have to tell you, though, that we, we, we built a red, yellow, green map over all of Kern County, and much of that land is federal, and we have no jurisdiction there. But we do work very closely with the military and with the local resource agency, for the most part BLM, and we have engaged on many occasions with the BLM and came out in, uh, in positions that reflect the military position on that as, as it works its way up as, as local government. But with respect to projects on, on private lands, that clearly falls in, uh, in our discretion, at least with wind. And we always have under the CEQA review, whether it's solar PV or thermal PV, and, and one of the things that I think, and I'm not quite <coughs> sure, Dave, how this is going to unfold, uh, there's a lot of things that the Department of Defense cannot do, as you, the, the statutory language, you have to live within that. But there's a lot of things that we, we, we can do that, uh, that perhaps, uh, you know, can't be done through, through the normal flow of, uh, of, of your approval process, but I think figuring out the communications in that between local installations and your office, because we don't have to make hard and fast findings. Uh, within the framework of law that we have, we look at two things. Is it consistent with our general plan and zoning? Uh, and is it, is it compatible? And that's a, very, uh, that's a very low bar to meet as long as it's what the courts will use uh, in our discretionary decisions was, was it rational? They generally won't get engaged in the qualitative component, but is it merely rational and give us very broad powers in that? So with respect to activities on private lands, uh, communications at, in, in, in what other, whatever forum with us, I think is vitally important and we work very hard to, uh, to try to do that. So that's, uh, that's the joint land use study. And we also, uh, besides implementing uh, the second part of that, the implementation phase, the last three things that we're doing in that kind of northeast quadrant of Kern County where uh, China Lake resides, for a number of years, uh, uh, the Navy has been working on their AQ study for uh, the weapon station at China Lake. And finally, we have a, a document that also incorporates the noise profiles for the uh, Joint Strike Fighter. I've had, uh, I've had money set aside for several years uh, such that when the AQ study was completed, we have the Joint Land Use Study, and we're going to do the implementation phase of that. But we're doing a specific planning area, uh, about a 30-mile radius around China Lake, and uh, we're going to create some uh, unique rules for that particular area, and we're going to incorporate those components. 
of the uh, AQs and the joint land use study and codify them into that specific plan. So as opposed to being more advisory in nature, which typically a joint land use plan or an AQs happens to be, we want to codify it and give it the force of local law so that it, uh, it makes it more long-term and predictable and uh, less, less subject to uh, how it's applied over the, over the long term. So with that, just kind of wrapping it up, uh, it, it's, uh, we, we've had some success. We think it's because we've had great partnerships and we've built great trust with our military friends. But these are the things I've heard throughout the <coughs> conference, and I just echo that they're vitally important, and without them, uh, you're, you're probably just really treading water and working very hard and not getting a lot of momentum going. And what we've learned over, over time, uh, and I think it applies to DOD also, is that if you're not at the table, you may find yourself on the menu. Thank you. Yes. We have had some. Uh, we've had some discussion. Uh, we can. We can. Uh, we actually have a requirement now that it be uh, on a on the documents you file with a recorder, whether it's a subdivision plan or a parcel map, that it be filed there. But uh, frankly, most buyers don't look at that level there. There is some pushback with uh, uh, obviously the real estate folks and the developers, but. Uh, we're, that is our goal. We, uh, one of the first implementation things that we would like to get on the table with this policy group is we need to make it happen. Uh, but yes, there is a little pushback, but I think we're going to be committed to, to uh, addressing that. It's been successful in some other areas, particularly uh, when you get the noise complaint call. By having that as a real estate disclosure where you sign it at the time of purchase, it's real easy to say, do you remember when you bought this house and closed escrow? Uh, you know, you signed something, oh yeah. And then a lot of times the anger or the emphasis detunes to, yep, I did know that. And now it's, uh, it's a little less volatile. They may not like it, but they can't say they didn't know. That's what we would like to see. Now, there may be other, other areas. We're open as, much, as many ways as we can inform the buyer, uh, whether it's through what we record, whether it's through the closure documents, or if there's some other tools, uh, we're completely open to that. And as we, as we begin this process, we'll try to crystallize the appropriate actions. Yes, sir. I don't have the answer to that one. I probably will defer to uh, Dave on that. There's a group that uh, Bill represents us on at the White House called, um, what are we calling it now? Re uh, Renewable Energy Rapid yeah. Reaction Team. Um, and so we are trying to link all of the federal agencies. It, it's almost like the clearinghouse. Um, what we are doing for DOD, pulling together the services and the joint staff and OSD and getting information to and from all the right folks, 
Um, we have an analog um, in, on the white at the White House staff that jointly led by the Council on Environmental Quality, Department of Interior, and uh, Department of Energy. Um, so that's how we're trying to make sure we talk to each other. Uh, in terms of trying to create buffers for uh, technologies that haven't been created yet, um, question gets asked from time to time, especially by folks who've spent their whole life around the test world, and the simple answer is we really can't. I mean, we are a property rights nation, and I can see no way of going to any public body in the world and saying, please don't allow that uh, landowner to do that on his or her land because we might come up with a cool toy where we would need that. It, it's a non-starter politically. So what we are trying to do is uh, identify those handful of places, White Sands Missile Range, uh, Nevada Test and Training Range, um, R2508, and do the best science we can and create lines that we tell everybody, and then it will be up to us, you know, to do the kind of ops where we can continue to do testing inside those lines. Um, I have not seen the maps yet, but I know that, uh, you know, from having been engaged as I have with the R2508 study, that there will be a, uh, a circle, let's see if we can, <clears throat> there will probably be a circle of electromagnetic interference. Um, they will do the uh, test flights for radar testing in this direction, and it will probably go out like this, and we know that, uh, well, the, the single turbine on Marine Corps Logistics Base Barstow, um, which a couple of years ago, the same folks who are doing it now said, hey, that's fine, there won't be an impact, that's in what we consider the green zone. Well, now with science, we recognize, oops, and if we had known two years ago what we know now, we would have asked the Marine Corps to put in some PV <laughs> because we have demonstrated from the single turbine, we have demonstrated a degradation in the capability to do airborne tests at Edwards and China Lake. So when we really get our stuff together, we're probably, and when we have the science complete, we're probably going to go to the Marine Corps and ask them for some voluntary curtailment. Um, and, you know, some of the folks down there have already, uh, you know, started the right discussions between Edwards, China Lake, and, um, and Barstow. And, you know, it, I can foresee certain kinds of test sorties where they'd call up the, uh, you know, the Marines and say, please turn the turbine off for the next three hours. Boom, and it'll happen. But what we will probably get is a kind of a Rorschach blob of radar interference that goes somewhere around here, and then, oh, by the way, right here we have the Nevada Test and Training Range. Right here we have US 95 going up through Nye County and Esmeralda County, and it, there's transmission, so you could conceivably put wind, but I have already, um, I, I kind of have an idea where the Air, Air Combat Command study is going to go as well. Um, and I've already dropped the hint with uh, Harry Reid staffers who know where I'm coming from and, you know, trust me as a, a straight shooter, that we could probably, by the time both studies are done, create a world in which we should say there should never be turbines in the Amargosa Valley so that we keep a completely clear zone that links the two. And therefore, if you're at Edwards Point in Northeast, or you're on the Nevada Test and Training Range point in west-southwest, you have got that electromagnetically free of turbine zone. It's a great place, by the way, um, for solar trough and for PV. So again, you know, this is not saying no to renewable energy development in Nevada. It's saying no to a single kind that has <laughs> a demonstrable impact, and that's a key word that we're, you know, putting into the, um, the federal rule. We have to be able to demonstrate an impact. You know, we can't just say, well, we think we'd have a problem. No, we're going to come to, you know, put some science on the table. So, uh, uh, and once we've done that and carved out with the science we have it today, you know, a, a way to preserve testing and training capability for the most advanced systems that we have, um, from that point on, we will have to live with the outcome, and if in 20 or 25 years there's some really cool toy that can see wind turbines from 100 miles away, 
will know already to build something into that system that tells you know that tells it how to ignore the turbine. That's got to be the next step that we do because China is putting turbines all around the Taiwan Strait. So um, maybe we need to figure out how to deal with it. But first, though, we have to have a zone that's clear of them so that we can create the cool toys and know how they work, you know, down to absolute uh, nth degree. So um, let us take 30 minutes. Let's come back at 10.15. We've got uh, a very interesting story of Cascade County, Montana, and uh, discovering the potential impacts of wind turbines on microwave transmissions between silos and missile sites. And uh, um, so Commissioner Briggs will, will have a good story to tell. Bill will warm up the karaoke machine on uh, singing a song of R&D. And then we should have a few minutes for some good, um, some good discussion. Let's grab some coffee or a snack. <laughs>